we need to talk a little bit about uh, selecting some of the components that you'll need for the car. And Brian's going to show you, after I've ingeniously selected them, uh, how to put some of them on the car. And uh, you'd be surprised how much time we spend on very ordinary mechanical things like getting a hose to hook up to two uh, uh, connections and a, and a hose clamp on it, it can be uh, quite a bit of work. Um, it's necessary that you focus on that task and drive that to completion. And there, we have two kind of philosophies. One is overkill is always appropriate. Although Brian doesn't let me play with a hammer much anymore. No, just a little. I'm getting better. <laughs> well, I'm getting better right not playing with it. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and the other one is to take your time and try to complete it where you, it doesn't cause problems later on. Uh, you don't want to wind up at the end with a car with a whole lot of things that, that have to be revisited. Uh, there are going to be some things that have to be redone. I don't care how you did it. Um, we've missed by a 32nd of an inch uh, 300 times. But with careful component selection and, um, and with a great deal of attention to detail that Brian applies to f the fitment or the fitting of those uh, components, um, and try to try to finish up a task at a time and get it done. Um, eventually, the car gets done, and really, it isn't that long. Most of the conversions, um, the, the guys who are really into it, uh, do them in in two to three months. I'd say the most common time period. What would you say, five or six or months? Five or six months. To, to uh, do it. We're probably looking at a year on this one, but we keep having to stop and videotape it <laughs> for you all. Uh, <laughs> if we were free of that, I think it, we'd be done we by now. We'd be done by now. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about um, component selection. I um, One of the things I detest about taking a car apart and the one where I never can envision getting it back and it ever really being a car again is the dashboard. I'll do anything to a car except pull one of those screws that hold the dashboard in. Uh, and getting up underneath the dashboard is uh, Brian's job, by the way. I can't do that at all. I did try once, and it took three neighbors and some uh, medical professionals to get me back out of the car. We won't repeat that one. <laughs> a little butter. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Upside down, though, with my head up under the dash is not my best position. So one of the things that you're going to run into with a car like this, um, but really any realistic um, car that's not a toy like our out with your girlfriend or wife to the winery, but a car you actually use is going to have an environmental control system. And people wrestle with that, I think, uh, more than about anything, and and with less uh, good effect uh, for most of the electric cars I've seen. I think so. We're going to show you how to keep the environmental control system in the car and not have to mess with it much. We may hunt down a couple of wires to steal some signals. Mm -hmm. But that environmental system on that dash, um, we've tried it. We have the engine out. Um, we hooked up the battery and the air blows and it mm -hmm. switches in the different modes and it all kind of more or less works, right? Yeah, our, our comfort system really is working our environmental. I mean, obviously we're not cooling or heating, but our blower's working. We're, I think we're getting everything that we're going to need. And you're right, track down a couple of signals and some, some 12 volt. So the modes seem to know what mode they're in. Yes. And yes. All right, cool. That's a, that's a huge gain. That uh, engine control unit always scares me. But apparently we've got a different bus in the passenger compartment for a lot of the things. It's a little bit separate from this uh, CAN do. bus on the ECU. Yes, we do. Yes. All right. So what we want to do is simulate um, some of the engine components. Now I've assembled a lot of things here we're not going to use, but I want to talk, kind of walk you through how we do a selection process on a component. This is a Holmes electric heater purchased at Walmart for the princely sum of $15.98. Now why it wasn't $15.99, I'll never know. 15 dollars but, but 
Walmart's <laughs> just not been the same since Sam left. <laughs> so that's uh, the deal. This is, we used uh, two of the cores out of this, mm -hmm. took it apart, um, used the core out of it for the Speedster. It was largely an exercise in frustration. We were talking about heating a convertible. That's right, yeah. <laughs> which doesn't do much good in, in the, in the uh, winter. But in the spring and the fall, on an evening drive, that uh, warm air kind of blowing on my elbow yeah, right. is pretty good. It does radiate up your elbow. So we took two of these electric heating elements. They're kind of neat. Um, apparently somebody in the government, to make us safe, has limited all these to 1,500 watts. You never see a 1,650. Well, thank you. I don't They're, want to get hurt by them. Well, I wouldn't <laughs> want to get hurt by too much heat either. And they do use a ceramic heating element that's kind of interesting. It has a negative uh, heating coefficient. And by that I mean the hotter it gets, the higher the resistance goes, the less it conducts. And so um, it'll heat to a certain point, about 1500 watts, mm -hmm. and applying more power simply makes the temperature go up, the resistance go up, and the current go down. And so it's kind of self-regulating. It's a pretty safe heating element if you kind of guard it with metal instead of uh, cat fur or something. So we took two of these, they're 1500 watts each, put a fan on them and use it to blow air into the Speedster. Yep. That's, that's a very common thing with conversions. Mm -hmm. um, the more advanced version of that is people take their whole dash apart take their heater core apart and splice these into the middle of it and I don't think it's a very good solution. Um, it's inexpensive but you sure have to take the car apart a lot and worse you wind up with 1500 or 3000 watts of heat in the car um, and your, your battery pack voltage in the cockpit with you. I'm a little mm -hmm. strange about that. If there's anything we can do to keep it out, now in this case we're going to have the whole battery pack in the compartment with us, so I guess it's not a big deal, but, but I don't like this system too well. Certainly for this car, we need more power. This vehicle is accustomed to having an endless supply of heat from the internal combustion engine. Internal combustion engine most of the energy you put into it in the way of gasoline is blown out the front of the car through the radiator, believe it or not, not through the exhaust. It converts the gasoline to heat and uh, motion almost as a byproduct. And the whole front end of your car is designed to get rid of the heat. But we tap off part of it and run it into a heater core under the dash and back out with a simple two hose system even today. And so we're going to talk about how we could electrically uh, make that happen. Um, and here is a relatively cheap way. This is a uh, Cat's Heaters Circulation Tank Heater. This is actually designed to be a preheater on your um, engine block in the winter. And it's about 139 bucks. It has a little bracket. Oh, some connections. And basically what this is is a little water tank with an electrical cord on it. And it uh, heats water with a 1500 watt um, uh, electrical element. That's an interesting amount of wattage in that it's the same as one of these little cores. But we're heating water and running water through our heater core. And so we've accomplished part of our objective. Part of, right. We didn't have to take apart the heater core or take apart the dash, but we have um, a little heater. Now this, of course, is meant for 120 volts AC, um, and it has a little cord on it. We can work around that. Uh, we can apply a pack voltage to it. Uh, broadly, when you talk 124, 120 volts AC or any AC voltage, the DC equivalent of that would be the AC voltage um, times a factor of 1.414. Mm -hmm. It's that's the the peak of the sine wave. 